In this video, we will talk about the phonetics of vowels and how we can use the motions of your tongue to describe the different vowels in the languages of the world. We're going to use two main dimensions to describe vowels, how front or back your tongue is in your mouth and then how high and low your tongue is in your mouth. Let's begin with the first one, frontedness. In some vowels, your tongue is more towards the front of your mouth. For example, in e, e. In some vowels, like this one, u, u, the body of your tongue is the one touching the roof of your mouth, and so your tongue recedes a little bit. E, we, we, we. Please pause the video and give it a try. Try to say e u in succession, in quick succession, so that you can feel your butt, your tongue moving back and forth. Please pause the video. Welcome back. All right. So as you can see, some vowels have a position of your tongue more towards the front and more towards the back. Some of them are central, like this one called a schwa. This is the first sound of the English word about, uh, uh. And in this one, the tongue is in a more central position. Eww. Eww. Um, as you can see, the frontedness dimension is also what make the difference between e o e o, for example. The second dimension, in addition to frontness, is the height of the vowel. Our tongue can be high, mid, or low. For example, e -a -a. in that sequence, the vowel e has your tongue very close to the roof of your mouth. In a, it's towards the middle, and then in a, your tongue is resting towards the bottom of your mouth. E -a -a. Please pause the video and try this out for yourself. Yeah, yeah. This is also the difference between uo, uo, for example. Uo, uo. The schwa that you can see here is again in a neutral position, kind of in the center, both in front to back and in height. Uh, uh. By the way, this dimension can also be described by these words, closed and open which is what your jaw is doing. When you're saying an E, your jaw is closed. E. But when you're saying an A, ah, your jaw opens a little bit. E -a, e -a, e -a. I'm going to use the height terminology from here on. The third way in which vowels can uh, differ is but what your lips are doing. In vowels like E, your lips are spread. E -a -a. E -a -a. And on the left position of each of his, each pairs, you have the unrounded vowel, where the lips are spread. On the right position of the pairs, you have the rounded vowel. In these ones, your lips are rounded, pursed towards the front. Ooh, oh. So for example, E, U are different in that this one is unrounded, E, and this one is rounded. U. Give it a try. E, U. Please pause the video. Welcome back. All right. So we have a few dimensions for how we can describe vowels. By the frontedness of your tongue, it can be front, center, back. By the height of your tongue, it can be high, mid, or low. These have correlations uh, to how your the frequencies are displayed by the acoustics. So if you decompose a spectrogram, you will see different echoes of energy in the signal. We're going to call these formants, the first echo, the second echo, and the third echo, and so forth. And there is a correlation between the position of your tongue and 
the uh, the position of each of the echoes. So, for example, the lowermost echo, um, F, which we're going to call the first formant, or F1, is uh, has an inverse relationship to the position of your tongue. So, for example, very high uh, vowels have a very low F1, whereas very low vowels have a higher F1. As you can see here, this is E, the, the, the vowel E as in heat, and it is very high in tongue position. So it has a very low F1. The vowel U as in hood, which is the one here, is also low. It's also, I'm sorry, it's also high in tongue position. So it also has a low F1, hood, 450 hertz. If we go to low tongue positions, they're going to have higher F1s. For example, had has this vowel, which is low in tongue position, and it has a relatively high F1 compared to heat, for example, 280, 690. High to low. The frontedness uh, of a vowel is correlated to the second echo, as you can see here. So, for example, and this one is um, linearly correlated. So, if you have an E, like in heat, that has that is very fronted, this is going to have a very high F2 value, 200, 2,200 hertz, for example. If you have a vowel that is less fronted and more central, like the one E eh, had, this is going to have a lower F2 value. And if you have a vowel that is back, like the one in hood, you're going to have an even lower F2 value. So you can see how different positions in this vowel triangle correlate to different positions of the spectrographic energy. And this is what the computer is going to have to learn when it's identifying which parts of the spectrogram correspond to which of the vowels. There's other ways to describe um, vowels uh, in languages of the world. For example, some languages have nasality, where you can uh, make words different. You can distinguish between words by having a nasal vowel versus a non-nasal or oral vowel. This is an example from French. La voyelle on. Po. Pont. Mo, mon, mm -hmm. po, pon, mo, mon. Some in these ones, some part of the air exits through your nose. Bribri has that same uh, distinction. So, for example, u, u. The first one is a house. The second one is a pot. U, u. In this last one, ak, ak. The first one is a stone. The second one is a cheek. Ak, ak. La voyelle. There's another distinction called vowel length that some languages use, which um, when um, you can distinguish between words by having a shorter or longer vowel. In Japanese, for example, beer and building have this difference. The first word is biru with a short e, and the second one is biru with a long e. Biru, 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 biru. Uh, Aotearoa Māori, Māori from New Zealand also has this. Keke, keke, cake versus armpit. Keke, keke. And some dialects of English also use vowel lengths to distinguish words. For example, Australian English. This is the word bid, and this is the word bid. Bid, bid. And vowel length is the one that distinguishes between these two words. There is another important phenomenon called tone, which doesn't happen in English, but it happens in about 40% of the languages of the world. Tone is a change in pitch that can change the meaning of a word. So in English, we don't have this. Uh, whatever pitch you use with your words is not going to change the core meaning. If you say really or really or really, 
these are all the same word, just with different intentions. However, in um, Mandarin, for example, the pitch does change the meaning of the word. For example, ma, 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 ma are four different words made different because they have different pitches. Ma. You are going to be able to distinguish this in the spectrographic signal because um, you can get the pitch in the spectrogram. And the pitch is the frequency of your vocal cords. And by the way, the formants are the echoes of the vibration of the vocal cords. So the, what your vocal cords is doing is like where all the echoes start. It's the very first thing that kicks them off. So we call it fundamental frequency or F0. In English, the pitch corresponds to intonation. For example, you can see, for example, if you record really, really, that the pitch will change. In languages like Mandarin, the words xin, cheng, hao, da uh, have different pitches, and this makes for different meanings. Finally, I want to show you something really cool, and that is going to be a massive issue for us in speech recognition. I'm going to play you um, a clip from English. What is this person saying? This is, uh, I'm going to uh, reproduce the clip and it's going to uh, be heard three times. What is the person saying? Fran, 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 Fran. What are they saying? They're saying Fran, Fran. Friday night. What the person is saying is so jealous my friend it was so stupid believe it or not the person only said fray 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 however your brain reconstructs that sequence and makes you believe that you heard the words friday night what the person did was reduce her speech so that some of the sounds were blended together for example and because uh, she said this faster, Friday night, this section was lost, as was this one. And then the nasality of the end survived by making this vowel nasal. So it's the first two parts of Friday, a vowel, and the nasality of the next word. Friend in. So jealous. My friend, it was so stupid. And I promise you what she said is actually friend. And you heard Friday night. We call this speech reduction and it's going to be a massive issue for us in speech recognition because there isn't a one-to-one -one mapping between the spectrogram and the sounds. Often humans reduce their speech and this is not a bug. This is a feature of human speech because you can um, make the signal more compact and more efficient and the listener is going to reconstruct it out of the context. So humans are very good at doing this, at reconstructed, reconstructing a signal that could be compressed or corrupted, for example, because there's a lot of environment noise and so. But computers are going to be really bad at it because there's so much data that's overlapping. Um, for example, the computer will never be able to see that there was an A in that signal and is going to have to suppose out of this context that that word was Friday. This is one of the reasons why speech so recognition jealous, is so is difficult. So oh, there we go. In summary, vowels can be described by their position, uh, by the position of the tongue, whether it's front or back, whether the tongue is high or low, whether your lips are rounded or not. Many languages also use contrasts that involve how long the vowel is, whether some of the air exits through your nose or through your mouth, and by the pitch, and we call that tone. And we call it tone when it changes the meaning of the word. You're going to use spectrographic information uh, to identify the word, such as the uh, vibration of your vocal cords and the different echoes of the vibration. But sounds tend to be reduced and, and compressed. And an element of this sound could be in this part of the signal and they can get mixed together. And so there's not going to be a one-to-one -one correspondence between a chunk of the spectrogram and a sound. So there's going to be a lot that the computer is going to have to learn that depends on the context of the world.